guys, it's Ariana. Welcome back to my channel. So for tonight's video, as per usual, we're going to be reading some more scary stories and I'm in a Halloween skull scarecrow kind of makeup. I just felt inspired to do a pumpkin today. So I will link the tutorial that I followed down below. I definitely went off on my own and didn't really follow it near the end and it just kind of became my own thing. So I'll list the tutorial that I followed anyway, but it's really good and mine looks nothing like hers. I wanted to come on here tonight and read a scary story while in my Halloween makeup. So happy spooky season. And as per usual, I have my Wicked Candle in here. It makes my whole studio smell like caramel apple. And I have a Canadian Dry. This is the Cranberry Ginger ale they finally brought it back they bring it back every single fall and i'm so fucking excited because this is my favorite pop and i can only get it in the fall time so i just sprayed it everywhere and i'm so excited and i have my orange straw to be festive so if you don't like this makeup i don't care please don't leave me rude comments i tried really really hard to make a pumpkin skull and this is what i came up with so please be nice so without further ado let's just jump on into the stories so the very first story is from the Backwoods creepy section, and this one's titled Paranormal Experience While Hunting in NH Woods. Last night around 8.30 p.m., I went out to the edge of the woods of my property to set up a blind to shoot some nuisance coyotes that have been eating my chickens. I live in New Hampshire, at an area where people live near these woods commonly referred to as a phenomena known as bad nights. It's an eerie feeling where you don't want to be anywhere near a door or window when it gets dark, and you certainly don't want to be outside. Animal life seems to be affected as well, since it's always eerily quiet on those nights. Thankfully, it was a good night, so I thought I would be fine. I set up with a long-range modified handgun, a mounted night vision scope with a thermal setting, and a high-end night vision handheld. Both pieces of equipment have a high four-figure price range. I set up facing the woods, and for most of the night, I saw nothing, coyote or otherwise. A little before 10.30, I was scanning the field just before the tree line with my thermal scope when I saw a red orb pop up. It was about four feet off the ground, not moving. The thermal was giving a reading of 90 Fahrenheit, which made no sense considering it was around 40 Fahrenheit. Also, the scope is very high definition. I can see small birds at 50 yards away and they show up perfectly bird-shaped. There's no reason anything should look round. It also had a strange low quality, staticky look to it, which made no sense considering it was well within my 50 yard marker at the tree line. When I went to switch to night vision mode, it disappeared. I never saw anything else like it for the rest of the night. Later on, around 11, my handheld night vision scope started malfunctioning. The brightness exposure was fluctuating wildly for no reason, and it was randomly turning on and off. I chalked it up to the battery being dead or dying, and I stopped using it. But this afternoon, when I started to get my equipment ready again, it was working perfectly normally. It's the same temperature again today, so it's not temperature related. The final weird thing was that at around midnight, right as I was packing up to head inside, after having no luck with the coyote problem, as my gun jammed and the animal ran off, I heard a voice laughing. It sounded echoey, and due to being on a hill and there being lots of trees, couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from. I thought it was my neighbor who lives on the other side of the field. Note, the house was not in the direction I was firing towards, just so no one comes for me for gun safety. The house was 200 feet behind me and to the left. This morning, my neighbor was talking with me about how the hunt went, and I joked with her that she should know considering she laughed after I missed my shot. She was confused, and I said I heard laughing and assumed it was from her house. She said no one in the house was outside or even awake at that time of night. So what do y'all think? Forest ghosts fucking with my equipment and laughing at me, or just equipment malfunctions? I'm going out again tonight, and I'll try to record if anything like that happens again. And that's how the end of the story. So <laughs> they're, all of their equipment started malfunctioning, and they heard someone laughing. Like, that's creepy. Like, that's not so much like a terrifying story as it's just like somebody in the woods like having equipment malfunction, but like the laughing, that's really, really weird. And I don't like that. And it kind of seems like the ghost was fucking with you and then making fun of you. <laughs> So thank you so much to Marked by NYX for allowing me to read your story and let's jump into the next one. So the next one is from the Spoopy CJ section and it's from the Reddit user Harper underscore Hutch and this one is titled, The Time My Friends and I Were Almost Kidnapped. Hi, this story happened six years ago when I would have been in fourth grade so my memory isn't perfect to the event. I used to do dance at a pretty crappy dance studio. All the teachers were extremely unprofessional and they really didn't care about us. A few buildings down there was a quick stop where we used to go to walk in between classes to go and get snacks and drinks. The teachers knew, and so did the parents, which thinking back now, that definitely wasn't safe for 11 year olds. I had never gone there because I was anxious. Two of my friends, who were two years younger than me, wanted to go, and so did my best friend. I was very unsure about going, but thankfully I went anyways. 
We got at the gas station and got our snacks and headed back to the dance studio. Before everyone else, I noticed that there was a man across the street yelling at us, telling us to come here. I'm a very fast thinker and always have been. So right away, I told the three girls, why don't we race back? None of them noticed the guy until we started running. Right as we started running, the guy ran across an extremely busy street. We reached the door and I finally got a good look at the guy. He didn't look to be in good shape and was definitely on some sort of drug. He had messy, greasy hair and was wearing dirty jeans and a very ripped blue flannel. We got into the dance studio and looked out the door to see who was standing in the parking lot. When we got back into the lobby, we started talking about the story with the other kids. One kid decided to go out and talk to the guy. I don't remember exactly what he said, but we all settled down and didn't see him much as a threat. That was until he started walking to the door. He came inside the studio and all of us stood back. Someone said, who are you? And he said, a parent, which we all knew wasn't true. The studio wasn't very big, so everyone knew everyone and their families, including the people who picked them up. I got freaked out, so my friend and I ran back and got one of the teachers. She then yelled at him and told him to get out. The worst part is, when he ran out, there was a white van pulled over and picked him up. We all got yelled at. I mean, it wasn't very smart of us, but the teacher told us, and it has always been a rule, that we were not allowed to go to the gas station, which was a lie. We would tell them that we were going and they were always okay with it. Long story short, we are dance studio man, let's never meet again. That's so fucking creepy. Like. That just gives me the fucking heebie-jeebies. I don't like that at all. Thank you so much for allowing me to read your story and I'm so glad nothing actually happened to you guys and you guys are all safe, but that's so fucking creepy. People are so fucking weird. I hate that. I hate that so much. <laughs> so the next story that I wanna read is from normal Dash Kangaroo 1803 and this one's titled, Need Help. I guess I'll just jump straight into it. A while back, about a year or so, I learned of a creature that can change its looks to mimic other creatures. People like their voice, looks, actions, etc. And shortly after, odd things started to happen around my home. Now I lived in this apartment for three years, and up to this point, I had never noticed anything supernatural happening. No levitating items, no spooky sounds, no pictures randomly falling off the walls, nothing. That all changed after a friend of mine told me his story. It started small at first. Some pictures that were hanging on nails would randomly fall, things would disappear and reappear in places, I know I hadn't put them, and my dogs, who never bark, would freak out and start barking at random spaces that appeared empty. At first, I thought it was something to do with the upstairs neighbor, who was loud and would stomp their feet whenever they walked around the apartment, but it continued even after they moved out. This isn't even the worst of it, just the beginning of the horrors I've experienced. One day, I was showering, I looked up and noticed a female face staring at me. Some context here, I am married to a very beautiful woman who doesn't believe in any of what I'm telling you even though she has experienced it herself. This woman looked identical to my wife, as in she could have been my wife's twin. As soon as I noticed her, she disappeared behind the shower curtain. Now, I just thought my wife was pulling a prank on me and was trying to scare me. She has a bad habit of doing so and knows that unless she jump scares me, I don't get scared easily. So I turn off the shower, open the curtain, and find no one in the bathroom. This is enough to set my alarms in my head, but being an idiot as I am, I ignored them. So I threw on a towel and began searching the apartment for her. Guess where I found her? If you guessed I didn't, then you would be correct. After searching the apartment and coming up empty, I decided to call my wife. She didn't pick up the first time, so I called again. This time, she picked up and told me she was at work. And I could even hear her boss in the background talking to other employees. This scared the shit out of me because her job is 30 minutes away from our apartment and it had been less than 10 minutes since I had noticed the woman spying on me. I freaked out and was very concerned for mine and my wife's safety. I searched the apartment again, looking through every room, closet, cabinet, you name it. I searched there to make sure that there was no one hiding in our apartment. All the while, I'm telling my wife about what had happened. My wife, bless her heart, came to two conclusions. One was that I had someone over and was cheating on her, to which I asked her, why would I tell you any of this if that was the case? We don't talk to our neighbors, so they aren't going to be like, ah, yeah, the other day I saw some girl leaving your apartment and she dropped that one, but is stuck with the second one. That being that there is a ghost in our apartment and she just wants to see some D. <laughs> if that was the case, I would be okay with it since I'm not the type to hide what I have, but it got worse. The next time I noticed the girl's face, I knew my wife was home. Once again, I had just finished washing my hair when I noticed her in my peripheral vision. But since my wife was home, I mistook her for my wife again. I pretended to not notice her and turned my back to her so I could fill my cupped hands with water. When I spun around and threw the water at this thing, it didn't pass through her. 
it didn't hit her face either. To my horror, maybe a foot away from my body was an outstretched gray skinned hand with blackened fingernails. The hand had stopped moving the moment I splashed water on her and jerked back a few inches before slowly moving out of view behind the shower curtain. The face, which I can definitely say was the exact copy of my wife's, lingered until a knock on the bathroom door came. Once the face had vanished, I quickly leapt out of the shower and ran to the door. When I opened it, my wife was standing there. Both of our dogs were beside her, growling and charged into the bathroom, sniffing around. The strange thing is that they seemed to stop and bark at the small vent in the bathroom ceiling. Again, our dogs rarely bark and had never barked before these events began to happen. Now, fast forward to last night. This time, my wife is taking a shower and I walk in to find what looks like a small child peering in on her. I make a small noise, but that's what I do when I'm confused, and it jumps into the fucking shower. I rush over and pull the shower curtain open to find a surprised and confused wife standing under the water, looking at me like I had lost my damn mind. Now, I have come to two conclusions. Either this thing that is bugging the shit out of me is one of the creatures I have written about, or I'm just simply losing my ever-loving mind. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Edit. I appreciate the advice given to me, even if it appears I do not. These are a few things I'd like to clarify that have been asked in the comments and in my DMs. Number one, I did not mention this because the post was already long and I just wanted some advice, but whatever the hell this thing is, it can cause the temperature in my apartment to drop to 42 Fahrenheit. And no, I do not mean a single spot. Unless cold spots can be done in multiple places and around everyone's apartment, I mean the entire apartment. Number two, Yes, whatever it does seem to follow me and sometimes turn my car into a freezer in the middle of summer, seconds after I enter it. Number three, no, I do not use medication, nor do I mess with any magical stuff. Number four, no, I did not use a Ouija board. I find the thought of trying to contact the dead to be foolish. Number five, I do not have any mental illness. That was one thing I had checked out months ago when things started getting really bad. The line, or my losing my ever-loving mind, was just me trying to make light of the situation, because that's how I deal with shit that scares me. Number six, I have talked to a priest. Even though I'm an atheist and they cannot come out and bless the apartment without being allowed to enter other apartments, presumably so, they can find the source of it, and I'm not on good terms with my neighbors to ask them to allow a priest into their apartment, so that whatever is happening in my apartment will stop. Number seven, I don't know why, but almost everyone thinks I saw a face in the vent, even though I never mentioned that. I only said my dogs, who are really quiet animals, were suddenly barking at the vent and my ceiling. I didn't see shit in the vent. So thank you so much for allowing me to read your story. That's really fucking creepy. I don't know what I would do. It just sounds like you have something haunting your apartment. Like that's terrifying. Um, I have no fucking idea. But seeing something like out of your shower with like an outstretched arm reaching to you and then you splash water on it and it like pulled back, that's terrifying. I don't like that at all. Like that's awful. No, thank you. So thank you so much for allowing me to read your story. That was really fucking creepy and no fucking thank you. <laughs> and the next story that I wanna read is from the no sleep section. So one of the YouTubers that I really, really like watching her videos, her name is CJ. She actually is the Reddit like owner of the spoopy CJ section that I read from a lot of the time. Um, actually read this one on her channel. So if you've already heard this story, I apologize, but it's in the no sleep section. And the Reddit author reached out and told me I was allowed to read more of their stories. So I really wanted to read this one because it's really fucking creepy. This is from the one underscore planchy underscore man. And this one is titled, we were stalked by a catacomb dweller in Paris. A few summers ago, I had the opportunity to study abroad in France. To say this was an amazing experience would be an understatement. I absolutely loved it. For this trip, myself and 10 other students from my university, including our company professor, would spend the month of June in Tallahouse. I don't know how to say that word, I'm sorry. But before our class started, we would spend four days in Paris exploring and having fun. I don't speak a lick of French going into this trip, but by the end, I would have learned quite a lot. This was because I never missed an opportunity to talk to someone. You'd be surprised by how much you learn a language by simply trying to speak to people in that language. I met so many people and had so many unique experiences because of this. We all did. However, there are times when someone you come across might be a little too eager to make friends. There are times when you have to know where to draw the boundaries. Our last night in Paris was one of those times, and thinking back on it, we were lucky because things could have gone so much worse. After arriving in Charles D. Gall Airport and getting settled into our hotel, we set out to explore the city. Over the course of those four days, we saw, I cannot say this word, I'm so sorry, it's a French word, I'll post it on the screen here. The Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, and Champ de Mars. Notre Dame from a distance, and this was right after the fire. And of course, enjoyed the amazing food that the city had to offer. We had more gelato and macaroons than I could count. It was a great time. However, I had also wanted to take a tour of the Paris catacombs. 
Unfortunately, time was a concern, and I didn't want to be out in the city alone without cell service to communicate with the others. On our last day after dinner, some of our group decided to turn in for the night to prepare for tomorrow's morning train ride south to Talos. Six of us, including myself, we'll call the others Natalie, Dan, Ari, Mara, and Oscar, felt the night was still young. Besides me, everyone was under 21, and since France's drinking age is 18, they wanted to make the most of it. Overall, we wanted to enjoy Paris as long as we could. Besides, we could just sleep on the train tomorrow. We headed off hopping from bar to bar until around 10 p.m. when we found one the girls liked. It was on a small, narrow stone brick road lined with small other restaurants and bars, their outdoor seating area filled with people. Inside, we found ourselves a round table and got drinks. I didn't realize it at the time, but one of the girls, Natalie, had been dropping hints on me the entire trip, and through my complete obliviousness, I had inadvertently rejected her and made her upset. As callous as it sounds, I wasn't really that concerned. I was having the time of my life. While I was waiting for my beer at the bar, a tall boy who looked roughly our age came up to me. He had curly brown hair and thick stubble. Are you American? He asked. Yeah, I said chuckling. How'd you know? Come on, my friend, he replied in a matter of fact kind of tone. The way you look, the way you are here with your friends all acting over there, it's very obvious. Everyone here can tell. I laughed, slightly embarrassed, and we started up a friendly conversation. I found out that he was a student at Paris Sorbonne University and worked at the Metro during the summer. At least that's what he had said. After a few minutes, we had become friendly enough that I invited him to our table. He seemed very excited to meet everyone. Introducing himself as Hugo, he was an instant hit, especially with all three of the girls in our group, who seemed immediately drawn to him. He was simply magnetic in the way he spoke and carried himself. His face seemed almost fixed in a warm, inviting smile, which showed off his nearly perfect teeth. Of course, the French accent certainly gave him charisma points. Natalie, in particular, was hooked. She almost never took her eyes off him as soon as he sat down. After everyone introduced themselves, we began talking about our trip and what we were doing on our study abroad semester. We talked about the US and all the stereotypes associated with it, which brought laughs amongst everyone. Hugo became the life of the party, even offering to buy our whole table drinks. At one point, Dan and I even sang along with a song in English that happened to be playing, which amused Hugo. Natalie was laughing the hardest at all of his jokes, even flirtatiously grabbing his arm and brushing his shoulder. Though we weren't entirely sure if it was because she was tipsy or if she actually was into him, Hugo was well enough aware and brought her more drinks, mainly Moscow mules, whenever she asked, and pulled out another Euro blank note from the seemingly endless supply in his pocket. He offered us cigarettes as well, though it was a surprise to him when he found out none of us were smokers. In one instance of attempting to produce another Euro note from his pocket, he accidentally dropped something the sound of plastic material smacking the wooden bar floor. Ari was sitting next to him, and upon hearing the sound, reflexively looked to see what it was. As Hugo leaned over and reached down to retrieve the object, Ari quickly looked back up. Eventually, after hearing about our time in Paris and the places we had visited, Hugo asked us if we had been to the catacombs. I told him that while it was something we would be interested in, we simply never got around to it. Oh, that is too bad, he said. This is your last day too, and the last tour ended hours ago. Yeah, it sucks, Ari said. Through her tone, she wasn't all too concerned. Maybe next time. The catacombs are fantastic. I think you really should have gone. Hugo was suddenly transfixed on the topic, now that it had been brought up. I love it. Imagine a city of the dead under your feet. Hundreds of kilometers of tunnels, much of them unknown. No way, dude. Dan had probably had a drink too many, several drinks ago. Sounds spooky, said Maria. Maybe you should take us next time we're here. Why wait, Hugo paused his voice suddenly slowing down. Why don't we go tonight? What do you mean? Ari asked. She could handle her liquor, and now she had suddenly sharpened up. I think we all knew what Hugo was implying, though none of us were willing to say it out loud. I mean, we visit the catacombs. I can take you there. Think of me as your personal tour guide. Hugo's smile never left his face. Yeah, totally, Dan shouted. How? I asked. They're closed, and most of the tunnels are restricted. Trust me, Hugo said. I go down there all of the time. Me and my catacomb friends, we know the tunnels. We know how to get in. There are secret entrances all over the city that no one knows about but us. By now my friends and I were looking over at each other, nervous, not sure what we should do. That's very interesting, Hugo, Oscar had said, trying to hint to him to change the conversation. But Hugo continued, you will see it's true, trust me. Tonight, we're having a party down there, lots of people. We have music, drinks, you want rosé, we have rosé. You want drugs, we have drugs. He looked down at Natalie, who was curled up under his arm. You want to come? I do, Natalie said, grinning. By now, she was drunk. Hugo turned to the rest of us. See, your friend wants to come. Yeah, I don't think so, Ari said, her voice more stern. 
Come on, Hugo said. No, I think we're good, said Ari. But Natalie wants to come. Don't you ruin the night for her, Hugo smirked. That's just too bad, Oscar added, because he wasn't much of a drinker, he kept his composure. It'll be fun. For whatever reason, Hugo was very persistent. You will get to meet my friends. We will all be friends. No, I think it's time we call it a night, I said. I really hoped Hugo would not try anything. The night is still young. Hugo stood up, pulling Natalie onto her feet with him. He pointed to a door in the corner of the bar room. There's a secret entrance to the tunnel in the basement of this bar. The owner knows me. He will let us in. Hugo, we have to get up and catch the train tomorrow, said Ari, sighing. You will have time. Just come, stay with us for a few hours, Hugo smirked again. Are you afraid of the police? We'll find out. They do not know the tunnels like we do. We're tired, buddy, I said, trying to keep the situation from escalating. By now, I was sweating. The night this time of year was already hot, and combined with the stifling atmosphere of the bar, it was unbearable. We had a great time, but we need to go. Natalie, come on, Ari gestured to her. The two had already developed a strong friendship over the past couple of days. Natalie turned to Hugo. I think they want me to go. She began pulling away from Hugo, but he pulled her back. No, he said to her, come with me. I will take you back in the morning. She has to go. Ari's voice was stern now, almost as if she had suddenly sobered up. She can speak for herself, said Hugo, his smile finally beginning to falter, his facade melting away. Hugo, it was nice meeting you, Natalie no longer her flirtatious self, but I have to go with them. She tried to pull away again, but Hugo maintained his grip on her arm. Let go. Oscar's voice pierced through the noise of the bar. He glared at Hugo, darting his eyes left and right, non-verbally telling him that it wasn't a good idea to pull something like that in a crowded place like this. Hugo's smile was completely gone now. He had fixed his eyes on Oscar's, slowly loosening his grip. He turned to Natalie. Looks like this is where we have to part. Really too bad. Yeah, sorry, Natalie replied timidly. Come on, we're going back to the hotel, said Ari. Where are you staying, Hugo asked. Natalie began to reply. Oh, we're at the Natalie. Aria stopped her, grabbing her arm. Don't. She yanked her away, leading her out of the bar. Night, night, bud. Dan waved at Hugo, in his stupor, oblivious to what was going on. Outside, I breathed a sigh of relief. I was still feeling the tension from inside the bar. I was shocked at just how persistent Hugo was. I apologized to the others, realizing I should not have invited him to the bar table, but something told me he would have approached us anyway. Regardless, we were just happy to have gone out of that situation. At least, we thought it was the end. It was nearly one in the morning now, and the streets were quieter. Natalie walked with her arm over Ari's shoulder and was just too dizzy to keep her balance. As we made our way to the nearest metro station entrance, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I was looking in every direction, occasionally glancing over my shoulder. Oscar must have noticed this, as we were both at the rear of our group. He gestured for me, and I looked back. I stopped and looked, and in the shadow of the building, partially lit by the amber street light, was a tall figure. In the silhouette, I could see the figure had a head of curly hair. It was Hugo. The others heard us stop and look, and were about to look themselves, when I frantically whispered for them to keep moving and pretend we didn't know Hugo was behind us. Ari whispered, yelled, and cursed to him. She tried to rush us, quickening her pace and almost causing Natalie to trip. We had to get to the metro fast. We had to lose him before he found out where we were staying. Ari finally spoke. Hey, guys, I have to tell you. But back at the bar, he accidentally dropped something out of his pocket. I only got a quick look but it was a driver's license. It was a California driver's license. The picture on it, it looked like a woman. What, do you think he knows you saw it? I asked. I don't know, I hope not, Ari's voice wavered. What the hell was he doing carrying around a California's driver's license? Mari stammered. Where did he get it? Let's not find out. Several blocks down, I glanced back. He was still following us. I could see him walking at a brisk pace while still remaining calm enough to not arouse suspicion as he passed in and out of the pools of light from the street lamps. I saw that he was diverting his eyes. Did he know that I saw him? We made it to the metro, quickly making our way down the stairs, through the turnstiles and other platforms to wait for our train. There was still a good crowd of several dozen people at that hour, so we tried our best to weave through them to hide. Ari, Oscar, and I continued to anxiously dart our heads towards the landing of the station stairs, hoping we would not see Hugo. In a few minutes, the train arrived and we rushed in, not wanting to spend a single second longer on that platform. After everyone had boarded and the doors had closed, I glanced over at the window of the door leading to the second train car, and my heart sank. There he was, leaning against the pole. He looked up, and for a brief second, our eyes met. Oh, shit. I quickly sat down, telling the others he was there. They panicked. There was nowhere for us to go. We couldn't leave. The train was already moving. Thinking quickly, Ari decided we would get off at the next stop. Our actual stop would have been the third one, but we couldn't let him know that. We had to get off as soon as possible to figure out how to lose him. 
Thankfully, that stop came up quick, and as soon as the door of the train opened, we rushed to get out, almost bumping into the people wanting to board. Briskly leaving the platform, we all could no longer resist looking over our shoulders, and when we did, sure enough, Hugo was there. He had gotten off as well, and was speed walking our way. Ditching the subtle act, he had now fixed his glare on us, eyes peeled wide open. We rushed through the turntiles, desperate to put as much distance between him and us as possible. Rounding a corner, we were relieved to finally see a police officer standing nearby. However, he wasn't just a normal officer. He was a member of the Gendemir, more aligned with the military rather than civilian law enforcement. We called out to him and instantly he turned to look in our direction. However, he only paid attention to us for a split second before his eyes immediately darted to Hugo, who had nearly closed in. The officer broke out into a sprint, yelling, police. Hugo hissed through his teeth as he immediately turned and ran. We didn't have any time to process what had happened because as soon as the officer had run past us, more officers, all of them, rushed into the metro. Some continued ahead to aid the first officer to pursuit of Hugo, while the rest, which were a team of GIGN, operated clad in body armor and clearing rifles, gathered around an inlet in the wall. The first officer had been standing outside of that inlet, and now we could see it held what looked like a service entrance of some kind. The GIGN officers stacked up carefully testing the handle. When they saw it was unlocked, one man slowly cracked the door open, checked inside with his rifle at high ready, and made his way in. The others followed suit. We realized that the door must have been to one of the secret entrances Hugo was talking about. Not wanting to stick around and feeling it safe to return to the platform, we took the train back to our station and returned to the hotel. The next morning, as we headed off to the train, Natalie took one final look at our hotel and let out a gasp that sounded like she had stopped breathing. There, spray painted on the front, was a message reading, I will miss you. Oh my god, that's so fucking creepy. So thank you so much to... Oh my God, I have to scroll a lot. The one underscore planchy underscore man. That's absolutely terrifying. I don't know if that's a true story or not, but that is absolutely fucking terrifying. And that was so well written and it was so captivating and I could see everything in my head. And that was just terrifying. This is where I'm going to end the video tonight because my house is just a little bit too loud to continue filming. And my camera is giving me the heat warning right now, telling me that it is overheating because I film in 4K. So. That's all the stories I'm gonna to read tonight. I will read more of my DMs and my emails in the next couple of videos. I know I said in the last couple of videos I was gonna do that, but I had a lot of Reddit stories to go through, so I just wanted to get through some of those first. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's spooky stories. I know they weren't all paranormal. Some of them were let's not meet stories, and some of them were just like crazy catacomb para stories, but I really liked the author of that story, so I wanted to read it. So thank you so much for watching this video. If you guys did enjoy this video, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below for more content like this, and I will see you guys at the next video. Bye.